All right, good afternoon to you. 506 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up this hour, we'll be joined by Eddie Scary at, at uh, 530 here. He's a columnist with The Federalist, and he'll react to the MSNBC meltdown. <gasps> they hired Ronald Romney McDaniel. Uh, and then everyone in the building pulled the fire alarm. <laughs> they're, they're really upset about this which is hilarious. I can't wait to talk about that. Can't wait to talk to you at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. The left, uh, well, they're losing their collective minds today because Donald Trump's bond in that ridiculous uh, case involving no victims whatsoever has been dropped today from $454 million to $175 million. Still a huge amount of money by any person's definition, but it is causing a lot of consternation on the left today. They're very upset that things are breaking Trump's way. For more on what's happening, I want to bring in Will Scharf now, now, a former federal prosecutor, an attorney for President Trump, and a candidate for attorney general in Missouri. Uh, Will, good to have you back with us, sir. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. This seems like a pretty big decision, uh, not least of all because it suggests that the court recognizes that the penalty imposed on Trump in the first place was totally over the top. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think the the court looked at at our pleadings. They looked at our briefing. Uh, They understood that we have very, very serious grounds for appeal in this case. And they understood that the bond being required was just wildly disproportionate. The reason the left is melting down is they sort of had these pipe dreams of Tish James going around seizing buildings and airplanes and whatever else. And that's been thwarted once again uh, just by a correct application of the law here. Yes. And it just goes to show how bankrupt this entire campaign of, of legal interference, of election interference uh, being stage managed by the left against President Trump really is. Is it is it true that uh, that Donald Trump, as of the ruling, had about five hundred million dollars in cash on hand? I'm not sure if that it seems to me that seems to be some of the press reporting on this. I'm not sure if that's a matter of public record. But if that is the case, it definitely definitely looks like Arthur Angeron wasn't trying to impose a penalty so much as he was to explicitly impoverish the guy. Yeah, look, as you said in your lead in, I mean, this may be the first fraud case in American history, the first pur- purported fraud case where there, there was no fraud, there were no victims. Uh, I mean, the banks all testified in our favor. The insurance companies testified in our favor. I mean, this is basically Arthur and Goron just pulling numbers out of thin air and trying to craft it as, as sort of a civil disgorgement remedy. I mean, the whole case is just totally lawless. Uh, we have endless grounds to appeal this thing, including the fact that uh, the New York Appellate Division previously reversed him on a crucial statute of limitations issue that was a ruling that he basically ignored in his final judgment here. So we're excited to get this case up on the merits. Yes. We're, we're going full speed ahead here. And uh, I think that original judgment, there's just no way it ends up standing. The Washington Post today in its coverage uh, quoted someone by the name of Adam Pollock, who is a former assistant attorney general in New York. And Pollock told the Post that he thinks that this is an extraordinary ruling today because he says the law is clear that you have to post a bond in the full amount. And it additionally suggests that there may be concern that the underlying judgment is, 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 is itself rather excessive. So help me untangle this. Is, is it normal in any way for an appeals court to drop a bond amount, or is this pretty unusual? So New York law is pretty clear that uh, the courts have discretion in terms of imposing a bond or in terms of allowing appeal to go ahead without a bond at all. Uh, in this case, it's worth noting that part of the judgment, part of the, the underlying case involves a court-appointed monitor supervising the Trump organization. So there was no issue here uh, of, you know, potentially uh, disposing of assets or hiding assets or anything like that. We made the argument that in light of, of the, uh, the frailty of the underlying judgment, in light of how excessive it was, uh, that no bond should be required, or at the very least, the bond should be significantly reduced. And apparently the court found that persuasive. Yeah. In terms of, of this being unprecedented or strange, I mean, I, I'd say that, the, the, the bond that Ngoron ordered here was entirely unprecedented in New York history. There's never been a private party, uh, you know, other than maybe a, a big mega corporation that's ever been required by a trial court to post uh, a $450, $500 million bond uh, just to exercise their rights to appeal. So this whole case is just highly abnormal. 
And I think that's reflected in, in the way it's proceeded. And we're certainly hopeful that on appeal we get this whole thing knocked out. Right. And the Associated Press, by the way, they dug in uh, and they said the same thing. They, fa- they have found no precedent at all. There is no other case that's ever looked like this in American history. That should tell you a lot. Well, and we went to, you know, surety companies, bonding companies in New York and said, you know, hey, what would it look like for us to get a bond in this amount? And company after company just said, we can't issue bonds that high. I mean, it was a, a literal impossibility to post the bond that Angoron ordered here. Uh, and, and that really speaks to, to what we view as what was a key issue on the bond briefing, which is that President Trump has a right uh, to, to challenge this case on appeal. I mean, he has rights afforded to him under New York law to proceed up through the appellate courts like any other defendant. And that was effectively being denied to him by the successive bond. And we're happy that the New York Appellate Division saw things that way. Yeah. The other piece that isn't getting much attention today, but I just wanted to highlight, that the appeals panel today uh, also said that Trump is now entitled to once again start getting loans from New York financial institutions, that he's not subject to a three-year ban on that, and that his sons, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump, can indeed serve uh, in, in a top position at a New York corporation, uh, despite Judge Angeron's efforts to block that. Is that your understanding, too? Th- that's correct. That's in the order this morning. Essentially, the appellate division stayed all the aspects of the underlying judgment that we would consider to be imposing uh, potentially irreparable injuries on President Trump, uh, his sons, and the Trump organization. So it was a, it was a wide-ranging stay. The judgment is not in effect. Tish James is not going to go around seizing buildings. Uh, and we're going to have the opportunity to appeal this case in, in its entirety. And and, uh, and that's the path forward now. Uh, she was defiant today, though. She released a statement saying that Donald Trump is still facing accountability for his staggering fraud. Uh, and she went on and on. What do you think of her behavior here? Well, look, Tish James ran for office on the platform of getting Trump. Uh, she's proceeded with this absurd case on an unprecedented uh, illegal legal theory. Uh, that just doesn't make no that doesn't make any sense right. when you when you cut it down to the bone. Uh, so I'm not surprised uh, really by anything that she's said or done. Uh, but fortunately, you know, we're in courts of law, and the law is ultimately going to end up uh, being the decisive aspect here, not whatever statements Tish James comes out with. And I think she's just a little angry that she doesn't get to go around with her her clown show attempting to attach assets and, and continuing to persecute President Trump and those close to him. There is still a lot of pressure on Donald Trump, though. Over the next 10 days, he's got to come up uh, with the $175 million. He sounded today a, a lot more optimistic about his ability to do that. Can you give us a sense, Will Sharf, of the logistics of that? How do you come up with money like that? I uh, Donald Trump did say he's got the cash to take care of it if he has to. Uh, what does that look like in the days ahead? Yeah, he said that publicly, that the bond was going to be uh, just, just taken out in cash, essentially. Um, we'll figure that out. We have 10 days to, to work through that, and I, I, won't, I don't want to get ahead of the team here. Um, but we are going to be able to, uh, to satisfy what the appellate division asked us to do, uh, and our appellate rights are going to be preserved. But as, as, as there are a bunch of other cases moving as well. I mean, we have a lot going on. Uh, we're apparently going to trial on the New York DA case. That's the, the criminal case brought by Soros-funded DA Alvin Bragg on April 15th. April 25th, we'll be in front of the U.S. Supreme Court on our presidential immunity appeal. Uh, so as always, we're, we're keeping legal reporters busy here. It's, it's endless. Yeah, that was the other big news today is that Alvin Bragg uh, case will begin uh, April 15th. Um, it, the, that, that case, uh, as I've been telling the audience, has been widely considered the single weakest case against uh, Donald Trump in the most ridiculous one, uh, where Alvin Bragg is alleging some sort of electoral meddling by having a non-disclosure agreement with Stormy Daniels. Um, give us a, a preview of what to expect as that case begins. So it, it's talked about as a hush money case, but it's really a, a pretty simple business records case. Uh, President Trump made payments to, uh, to his lawyer, uh, Michael Cohen, that he recorded as a legal retainer. And uh, what Alvin Bragg is doing is he's saying, based on Michael Cohen's testimony, that in actuality, that money was being paid to Michael Cohen to reimburse him for payments that he made to Stormy Daniels, and that that amounted to some sort of business records fraud. Now, Michael Cohen has been found by multiple courts at this point uh, to be essentially a serial perjurer. The idea that you would base a criminal case on his testimony, uh, just speaking as a former prosecutor, is insane to me. 
Uh, as you said, legal commentators have repeatedly uh, deemed that case the weakest of all of the cases against Trump. And I think that's going to be borne out in the New York courtroom. Uh, the reason for the delay, because this case is actually supposed to already be on trial, is that Bragg's office uh, had failed to turn over tens of thousands of pages of documents uh, that our team was entitled to. Yeah. Uh, that's a situation that's been worked out over the last week or two, and it looks like we're going to go to trial on that. But again, to base a case on Michael Cohen's testimony, it's uh, it's just crazy to me. It's, it's crazy. And also the, just the idea that if, if Trump had a nondisclosure agreement with Stormy Daniels that involved money, how does that rise to the level of a federal election law violation? I mean, Michael Cohen didn't even go to a jury trial on that question. He just pled guilty to it. It's It's been preposterous from the very moment it was first alleged. Well, and both the FEC and the Biden Department of Justice declined to take any action against President Trump on exactly this legal theory. So Bragg is really out on a limb here. I think that the indictment itself is legally defective in any number of ways. Uh, in addition to the, the serious factual issues they have trying to bring a case to trial based on Michael Cohen's testimony. But again, you know, this isn't even really about payments made to Stormy Daniels. This is about the way that Donald Trump recorded payments to his own lawyer. Right. The idea that that could amount to a, a felony charge under New York law. And frankly, it should be scary to every businessman in terms of the way that they go about recording their business expenses. Is this the only trial that's going to take place before Election Day? What What's the calendar look like in terms of the actual trials that the left is trying to force Trump into? Yeah, I, you know, I certainly hope so. Uh, the Florida documents case down there, that's an immensely complicated case with millions and millions of pages of discovery. I'd be surprised if that went to trial before the election. I'm hopeful that the Supreme Court uh, does what we're asking them to do on presidential immunity. Yes. Uh, that would certainly push back any trial. Uh, in, in the D.C. prosecution and probably the Georgia prosecution as well, long past Election Day. Uh, so in short, you know, the situation we were looking at last summer uh, where Trump was going to be forced to sit through trial after trial after trial at the height of election season, I think we've successfully thwarted that. I don't think that's going to be the dynamic, and I think he's going to have the ability to campaign vigorously to be our next president. One other case I know that's before the Supreme Court that incidentally involves Trump, I think there's a number of charges that Jack Smith has been bringing about uh, interfering in official proceedings. Uh, January 6th defendants are basically appealing this up to the Supreme Court, and the court's going to consider uh, whether or not they were even properly charged in the first place. The crime that's supposedly involved here uh, involves typically white collar crime, the destruction of evidence that's supposed to go before Congress, not people being in the congressional building. Uh, and yet Trump is being hit with charges here, too. Uh, are, are you hopeful that that case will result in some of these charges against Donald Trump being dropped? Yeah. So that's the Fisher case. It involves a statute called 1512C2, which, as you said, it was part of Sarbanes-Oxley. It was really about you know, shredding documents in advance of a congressional investigation or a congressional hearing, that sort of thing. In the aftermath of, of January 6th, the Department of Justice has used that charge to essentially create felony cases out of misdemeanor cases with a lot of these January 6th protesters. Uh, two of the four charges in the D.C. indictment against President Trump, uh, one is a 1512C2 charge and the other is a conspiracy charge under the same statute. Uh, so certainly if the Supreme Court uh, decides to, to strike down its use in those January 6th cases, uh, that could easily result in two of the four charges against President Trump uh, just disappearing. And that would affect the way that that case could be brought. It would affect the sort of evidence that could come in on the remaining two charges. We're definitely watching that one very closely. All right. And that would, of course, lead to more wailing and gnashing of teeth among the left, uh, which we're getting <laughs> a lot of. All right. Hey, Will Sharp, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and best of luck going forward in your uh, your race there in Missouri to become the next attorney general. Thank you, sir. To the phones we go. Phil in Fredericksburg, line one. Phil, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colonation. Hello, sir. Hey, Vince, look, I just want every American to wonder how they would feel if they had to come up with $175 million cash of their own money that they worked for, that their family worked for, yeah. because they didn't do anything wrong because somebody hated them and had power to do this to them because everybody that they did business with was satisfied. They had paid everything back. They had done everything right. But just because someone hates your guts, they can do this to you.
It's so wrong. It's unreal how wrong this is. Yeah, it's out of control. And, you know, I, I mentioned before the Associated Press, they went and they did a deep dive on this. And they said, I think it was in 70 years of records, they couldn't find a single case where you had no victims uh, and somebody was imp- hit, was hit with a penalty like this. It's it, 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 There's no precedent for it because the left is doing unprecedented things every day, Phil. It's absolutely outrageous. It has to stop, and he needs to get his money back. As far as I know, if he pays this $175 million, it's gone. I don't think he gets that money back. Yeah, I don't want to speak to that with certainty other than to say I think that, you know, if he prevails, he does get the cash back. But in the end, the, the, Letitia James wants to, you know, wants to take it out of them uh, entirely and give it to the state of New York, and then they can spend it on their other left-wing priorities. So that's the they, yeah, they, they'll exactly. make it even worse, uh, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Absolutely. I appreciate the call yeah. as always, brother. Uh, let me get uh, Robert in South Carolina in here, line two. Robert, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, Vince. Thanks, as always, for speaking the truth. Thank you. Hey, um, hey, listen, I just wanted to say two things. Number one, clearly, Letitia and Judge Engrong have never read The Art of the Deal. Everything Trump does, he's 10 steps ahead of his business partner, and I guarantee you uh, he's looking at this as a business transaction. Um, And I can't wait for Rachel Maddow's head to explode on MSNBC. (laughs) Yeah, if she's actually working. She's like part-time all the time now. Yeah, well, (laughs) it doesn't work. Um, You know, the other thing I wanted to bring up, Vince – you know, the, I think this New York case is a done deal. I, I'm a pessimist. I was having drinks with my neighbor last night. Mm-hmm. I told him, dude, don't worry. Uh, but the other thing, this, you know, this, the, this document case in, uh, in Florida, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I sit back and uh, I've, I've read the Presidential Records Act, and there's an exemption in there that if his staff or any executive officer gives him documents for, uh, to advise him, that they are exempt from a mandatory declassification review. So I, where are his lawyers on this? I mean, how, do, do these guys not read the, uh, the, 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 the regulations and, and laws that are being used to go against them? Interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there's been some good news. Been... There's been some good news in that case. And so far, the judge down there uh, is, uh, what's her name? I'm trying to remember what, what the name of that judge is. Uh, off the top of my head. It doesn't matter. Anyway, she's the one that the left hates because they say, oh, she's Trump appointed. She's being... T- too tra- Eileen Cannon. She's being too fair to him. Uh, she apparently has been saying during these court proceedings that yeah, there may be a selective prosecution case here for Trump. You know, they didn't charge Biden with stealing all these documents, and he was just a vice president. We're talking President Trump. He may have a pretty good case to make. We'll see what happens there. That's that's an interesting one, too. The left is nonstop. They're all over the place. Hey, good afternoon to you. 536 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we are making sense of the news. You can join us today at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. The left is positively melting down uh, for a number of reasons. We've covered a lot of them in the show. Uh, But one reason they're melting down is that MSNBC, NBC News broadly, has hired the former head of the Republican National Committee, Ronna Romney McDaniel, to work there. Oh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Ronna is not, like, beloved by the right. They're not looking at her going, man, I wish she was still the RNC chair. No, a lot of people on the right were like, it's time to go. Thank you. You're a nice person, but not winning elections is kind of a problem. So time to go. Time to go. Uh, and so she gets hired pretty quickly by NBC. And uh, over the weekend, uh, she had... She, she was on Meet the Press, and uh, the new host of Meet the Press is Kristen Welker. And Chuck Todd was so angry about this. Chuck Todd, the former host of Meet the Press, who was fired from that gig, comes back on to attack his own network now, not for firing him from Meet the Press, but for, for hiring Ronald Romney McDaniel. Here's how that sounded. Dive right in. What were your takeaways? Look, let me deal with the elephant in the room. Yeah. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. So I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Mm. Um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for her. So she has, she has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Yeah. Is she speaking for herself or is she speaking on behalf of who's paying her? 
what, once at the RNC, she did say that, hey, I'm speaking for the party. I get that. That's part of the job. So what about here? I, I will say this. I think your interview uh, did a good job of exposing, I think, many of the contradictions. <laughs> You and look, there's great. a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting, mm. have been met with character assassination. So it is, it, you know, that's where you begin here. Yes, yeah, at NBC we have such high standards. How can we hire Ronald Romney McDaniel? Uh, for more on this, I want to bring in Eddie Scary now. He's a columnist at The Federalist and the author of Liberal Misery, How the Hateful Left Sucks Joy Out of Everything and Everyone. And boy, do we see that this weekend. Eddie, good afternoon. Great to have you back with us. Hey, Vince. Good to be here. Uh, Chuck Todd is very upset, Eddie. Why is he so upset? Oh, God. It's so corny. It's so corny and cringe. And, you know, if I was um, Kristen Welker, the cure certain Kristen doesn't matter. If I was, If I was her... And, you know, it's not like I have some high regard for her. I would have looked at Chuck Todd and said, could you please shut up and answer the question? The question she asked him was weigh in on, like, my interview. He has to go into this, this, um, this white knight thing about how, well, I'm going to defend your honor. And our bosses owe you an apology, but you did a stand-up job. <laughs> how condescending. How belittling. And just, again, very stupid. And this is what actually journalists in Washington, they, they think is brave. Because, you know, I, I actually want to read you this quote that I saw in um, Political Playbook this morning. I don't know if you saw it. The whole, the whole like, uh, top, top half of the, the daily newsletter, their, their most important newsletter in play, uh, Political Playbook, was about this whole NBC and Ronald McDaniel thing. And there's a quote, but it was an, it's an anonymous person, but the quote was, they're talking about Chuck Todd. The fact that he took it upon himself to not only say this, but frankly, to defend the woman who took his job is pretty remarkable. And then went on to say, he got a lot of attaboys from NBC and, and, and MSNBC, including from people who are not prone to give him much credit. I bet he read that and just absolutely glowed because he, they're, so, like, they're so proud of themselves. And, you know, on Morning Joe on MSNBC, it was a whole, another round of, you know, Joe Scarborough saying, she will not be a guest on this program. I can tell you that. <laughs> Let me, I'll play Joe. Here's Joe, so here's Joe this morning so people can hear that. Here it is. We've been inundated with calls this weekend, as have uh, uh, most people connected with this network, about NBC's decision <laughs> to hire her. Uh, we learned about the hiring when we read about it in the press on Friday. Uh, we weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it. And Mrs. Joe had thoughts, too. To be clear, oh. We believe NBC News should seek out conservative Republican voices to provide uh -huh. balance in their election coverage, but it should be conservative Republicans, not a person who used her position of power to be an anti-democracy election <laughs> denier, and we hope NBC will reconsider its decision. It goes without saying that she will not be a guest on Morning Joe in her capacity as a Paid contributor. <laughs> what is even happening? So, so they've spent the last you know, 24 hours attacking their own network for hiring Ronna Romney McDaniel. She's Ronna Romney McDaniel is not some flame throwing right winger. She's just, you know, she's like an establishment person. And she, you're right. She ran up. She ran the committee. She ran the RNC. She did. She did the job, which I think she did. I mean, I think you said it very well at the, at the top of this segment. Is I mean, doesn't this? It was it was a curious hire only to me in the sense of what are they getting out of it? She ran an operation. She was a pretty unremarkable person, um, other than her attacking her own family member and changing her last name to have little association with Mitt Romney. That was kind of funny. But otherwise, I mean. The Trump people don't really care for her. The anti-Trump people don't really care for her. So I don't know what the in is. I mean, it's a $300,000 a year, reportedly a $300,000 a year salary. Wow. Um, but then otherwise, I would say that what was, what's kind of funny about this whole thing, it tells you how little, how little NBC executives think of Joe Scarborough, think of Mika Brzezinski, think of Chuck Todd, that they didn't ask them, and they don't care that they're complaining and moaning and, and crying on air. They don't care. I mean, it won't surprise me if there is some kind of, well, actually, we made a mistake and blah, 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 because, because now there's so many of them um, retching about it. Um, but I think that from but, the beginning, it was just like they should understand. They don't care what they're I'm sorry, is. but, but think, let's, obviously, let's, let's bring up some of the other comparisons. So Ron and Romney McDaniel hired. Okay, fine. They've hired Jen Psaki straight out of the White House. She was the White House press secretary. Boom, right to, she lied to the American people in that capacity. She 
gets a television show on MSNBC. There's no, there's no, you know, wailing of gnashing of teeth going on about hiring Jen Psaki. They hired John Brennan after the former CIA director after he lied about spying on the United States Senate. Lying has been a feature of his career. There was no complaining whatsoever. In fact, they turned to him as the burning bush on all Intel community stories. John Brennan, MSNBC contributor. They have an entire show dedicated to Nicole Wallace. She's a former Bush <laughs> White House spokeswoman who has decided that her entire life is defined by how much she hates Trump. And she spends every day telling us that she's working out her emotional problems on the air. Fine. But they never once paused and were like, oh, my gosh, right from telling us that the Iraq war is justified or whatever stuff she said, you know, when she was a Bush person. Now she gets an MSNBC job and it's all totally fine. What? What? Oh, right. And I'm so glad you brought the Nicole Wallace one because that, that really is the major one. Nicole Wallace, it's not, you know, Jen Stuckey with Jen Stuckey, just terrible all around, bad at her job, a, a demonstrable liar, explicitly dumb. Um, they don't care about that. But, but Nicole Wallace, that's somebody who <laughs> she defended Bush and Dick Cheney. That, you know, that's how if you if so long as you you will shed any amount of dignity you have to suck up to these people. That's what matters. If Ronald McDaniel came out, uh, came out, the, you know, just guns blazing. I hate Trump. Put him in jail. Take him for every penny he has. Liquidate all his assets. She would be the star, the absolute star. They, they would make her head of NBC, MSNBC. She'd have three different programs. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. And. They have, like, Peter Strzok on their air. Like, a guy who, who spends all of his time, like, <laughs> like, I mean, attacking Trump supporters. You can smell them in a Walmart, he said. And then they're, like, happy to have him on the air. Um, it's, I mean, it's, like, it's just, it's actually so crazy that they're freaking out about this. I, I do want to uh, turn to what Rana McDaniel actually said on Meet the Press, uh, which I thought was interesting for a number of reasons. Um, let me see here. Like, I'll play. This is Rana saying that she was forced out by Trump. Now, remember, Trump. Trump picked Ronna McDaniel. She was there by the grace of Trump in the first place. Uh, in the end, she was sent away as he became the nominee. Here's what she said. Let's dive right into this and start with your decision to step down as RNC chair. If you can, take me behind the scenes a little bit. Were you pushed out of your role? Well, there's no question that as RNC chair, you have to remain neutral. And we had a primary process. And so we did have debates, right? We had debates and there was tension and a little friction that started during that process. It was well played out in the media. And I knew at that point when I was doing that role and we were going to have debates that when the nominee came forward and it was likely to be President Trump, that they would want to switch. And that's his right as nominee. And so were you pushed out by him? He, he absolutely wanted me to, to move aside and wanted Michael Watley and Lara Trump to come in. Now, they're turning this into a scandal on NBC, but it is actually pretty customary, actually, for the nominee to get a say-so on who runs the party. That's on both the right and the left. Right. And I, I mean, I guess the extent that it's um, newsworthy in any sense, it is that it is that Trump up until recently was very much uh, a, a Ronna McDaniel um, supporter. Yeah. He, he was like, absolutely. He, he, he pushed her for when, when there was, you know, I don't think it was, she was under any real threat when it was, um, Hamid, I can't remember the, the one, Army the Dylan. Tucker back. Yeah. When she was the one who was vying for the spot and uh, Tucker was got behind her and there was actually a, a pretty grassroots, solid grassroots push to get her in and, and, and Ronna McDaniel had locked it up pretty handily, especially with the support of Trump. I mean, that's kind of interesting. I will say, I will say that she she was it was a little bit surprising how forthcoming she was about that whole thing. But I think that that's what they should want. That's <laughs> what a news operation should want. You know, you know, we want transparency. You want well, yeah. you want the full story. Um, only the, the the one part that I that I listened to her and thought that's pretty weak was when you know she kept uh, um, Kirsten Wel Welker or whatever she kept pressing her on. Uh, do you, you know, you, you said that the, the election wasn't fair, 2020 election wasn't fair. Are you, are you still, are you saying that President Biden didn't win fair? And they played a clip of her back when she said he did not win fair. Okay, well, she's acknowledging he won. She just doesn't think it was fair. Right. I don't, I don't think that's a controversial position to take. You know, Hillary Clinton to this day says that 2016 was not on the level. Those are her words. You know, you can say that, and that's a perfectly fine thing to say, so long as you acknowledge what the actual reality is. And she, you know, she kind of waffled on that, which I thought was pretty weak. And I lost some of, of the respect that I have for Ron McDaniel a little bit yeah. of, of eroded. 
Um, but otherwise, I think that you know well, it, was a, it was a perfectly fine interview. She sat there for 20 minutes, and all these people just won't shut up about it. I know, I know. Well, the the, the whole like the election thing, the way people ask questions about the election too, M- M- MSNBC, NBC News, whatever you call them now, um, they are uh, they they draw false battle lines about how to think about the election. People have complex views about the election, including all of the meddlesome uh, uh, involvement that figures on the left have everything from the Zucker bucks to the hiding of the Hunter Biden laptop story to Facebook's involvement, Twitter's involvement, the FBI's involvement. If you don't, if the way we actually conducted the election, the ballots, the drop boxes, the changing of election laws, places like Pennsylvania, if you don't pause for a moment, you're like, man, that, that, that wasn't a good way to run an election. Then you're an idiot. You're, you're an idiot. There's no question. Oh, absolutely. And so, so absolutely. in other words, like you have every right to be uncomfortable with the 2020 election. In fact, that's the logical conclusion. Uh, here we go. One more for you. This is Ronna McDaniel being asked about Trump's plan to pardon January 6th defendants. Now, once again, listen to the dishonesty in the way that Kristen Welker asks the question. Uh, and the, just kind of the exchange that the two of them have. I think it's interesting. Do you disagree with Trump saying he's going to free those who've been charged? I do not think people who committed violent acts on January 6th should be freed. So you disagree with that? He's been saying that for months. I, Rana, why not speak out earlier? Why just speak out about that now? When you're the RNC chair, you, you kind of take one for the whole team, right? Now I get to be a little bit more myself, right? This is what I believe. I don't think violence should be in our political discourse, Republican or Democrat. And I disagree with that. All right. There's a couple of things to unpack here, but what, what jumps off the page here for you, Eddie? Well, okay. So she, is she was, was Welker asking her, um, do you agree with the decision to pardon or, or was the, do you, are you okay with January 6th? I couldn't even quite catch it. My impression, the way Kristen Welker set this up was to suggest that Donald Trump has endorsed releasing violent defendants from January 6th. Now I have been tracking the Trump the saga on this particular question. And Trump has offered qualified pardon offers throughout. In other words, if, if you weren't, you know, punching cops in the face and breaking windows, then you're a great candidate for a pardon from Donald Trump. He's never once been like, hey, the violent guys, they're all getting pardons. That's never been something he said or even suggested. And uh, meanwhile, Kristen Welker is pretending that that's the case and then trying to stick Ronna McDaniel there with it. Uh, and then Ronna McDaniel kind of almost like cowardly in a, in a way, in a cowardly way is like, uh, uh, well, I couldn't tell the truth before, but I'll tell the truth now, which is uh, nobody who committed <laughs> violence should get a pardon. I'm like, what? 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 Well, what right. And then this? there's only there's only one acceptable answer when you're talking with journalists as far as getting them to shut the hell up about this, about January 6th is it was an it was an armed it was an armed racist insurrection right. and yes they should all go to prison and donald <laughs> trump should never get to run again that is the only answer they will accept um and and you know for anybody who answers anything to do with january 6th and doesn't say let's talk about 2020 let's talk about the hostage situation that that the left the that the democratic party the rioting that they excused they instigated that they were okay with you know suddenly there's, now there's a riot they, they find defensive on the one day that was actually if you're going to talk about fire fiery but mostly peaceful that was january 6th and i think that they were lucky it wasn't a little bit worse when and, and some people might say it could have been a lot worse uh and you know that might have been okay with them but well, i think that you know if you're going to talk about january 6th you, I, I don't even I don't even want to begin the discussion and act like that was the day history started without well, talking about 2020. If it was worse, they wouldn't have to make up details about it. If if it was worse, they, right, they could the just point to enough. things that actually <laughs> happened. But the truth is not enough for them, so they they lie. Um, thank you, uh, Eddie Scary, as always, for your thoughts on all of this. Really appreciate your time today. Yeah, we do have this breaking news today that. Is it Puff Daddy? Is it P. Diddy? Is it Diddy? I don't know. But Diddy's L.A. Miami homes raided by federal agents as a part of a sex trafficking probe. The rapper uh, being gone after here by the Department of Homeland Security raiding his homes in Los Angeles and Miami. Sex trafficking. Holy cow. A bunch of helicopter footage of people being let out by handcuffs, taken into custody. The New York Post says that the raids were led by the Homeland Security Investigations Human Trafficking Task Force. Oh, DHS has a human trafficking task force. You could have fooled me. The great one, Mark Levin, up next here on WMAL.